What was the beginning of reality TV? This? How about this? This? Maybe this? But what if it went even further back than that? Right back to almost the beginning of television itself. And strangely enough, was to be found not on the small screen, but on a silver one. I need your help, Gilbert. I'm on the brink of a television series. Oh, better make that a large whisky, yes. Arthur. Weekly series? No, daily. Oh, no, no. You better bring the whole bottle. Simon and Laura is Muriel Box's 1955 comedy about a couple, both well-known actors, who agree to have their marital bliss broadcast every night on the BBC. The only problem being that in reality, they are on the verge of divorce. It's a great setup for a comedy, of course, but more than that, the film is strikingly prescient to a modern audience familiar with the cliches of reality TV. Use your left! Short arm jab! Short arm jab! That's right, Gran! Short arm jab! Short arm jab! <laughs> If there's one thing the cinema loves as much as films about films, it's films about television. Mostly it feels like a chance to draw the battle lines. In the movies, cinema is magical and transcendent. In the movies, heaven runs at 24 frames per second. Television, on the other hand, Television's mean. Please, Bobby, we're pushing. You're fired. I want you out of your office before noon, or I'll have you thrown out. I don't give a goddamn about f***ing Corona. Hey, give us a break, Thornburg. Eat it, Harvey. <laughs> now, I have to kill all of you. In the movies, television is just the worst. And the worst of the worst is reality TV. <laughs> It didn't come out of nowhere. There had been information films such as Return to Life, which featured the scripted experiences of real refugees, as well as fly on the wall observational series such as Seven Up and An American Family, along with its British remake, The Family, in the 60s and 70s. These are more documentary though, with some claim to social investigation or commentary. They may veer away from traditional non-fiction programming, but they still aren't quite reality TV as we know it. The modern reality boom was sparked off by the 1988 writer's strike, when unscripted shows were the solution to how to make TV without writers. The raw, handheld aesthetic of Cops came out a year later on Fox, followed in 1992 by MTV's The Real World, which created the housemate format. They were huge successes. And for the TV companies, reality shows were not just great protection against strikes, but you can fill up the airwaves far more cheaply than you ever could with narrative shows. And if anyone worried that real life would be boring, well... GET OUT! Get out! Get out! Get out! Hollywood had been watching too, of course. The late 90s brought two films about a man being filmed 24-7 for a television audience. 1998's The Truman Show, about a man born and bred in a city-sized studio, unaware of his life in a televisual goldfish bowl. And 1999's Ed TV, about an initially willing participant who soon regrets his mistake. In both films, their lives are manipulated by the scheming of producers looking for improved ratings, and each must fight to escape the system that's ensnared them. This is definitely a theme. One of the biggest giveaways of how filmmakers felt about television is how often it's a key part of a nightmare dystopian future. 1988's They Live chooses a television station as the control centre for the alien conspirators, and before the Truman Show's relatively benign antagonist Christoph, there was this guy. Damon Killian, the villainous host of The Running Man, played by real-life TV host Richard Dawson. He smells blood and nothing on earth! This is Killian. Get me the Justice Department, Entertainment Division. In 1980, Death Watch also traded on the idea of the public's fascination with dying in front of the camera, as Harvey Keitel's cameraman, a literal eyewitness, secretly broadcast the last days of a dying woman's life in a world where illness is a novelty. We've decided you're the best. Who decided? In TV. I can stay home and in three days. No, no, that won't work because we'll just make a mystery out of it. Headlines, Catherine Morton, ho, oh, where is she hiding? What is she hiding? Not a damn thing. I just want to get out of this life on my own. 
An early TV drama that predicted the rise of reality television was Nigel Neal's The Year of the Sex Olympics in 1968, showing a world where everyone but the elite had been reduced to apathetic viewers as a means of population control. Less an expression of pure power and oppression though, Year of the Sex Olympics plays on the symbiotic relationship between audience and broadcaster, as the producers seek to understand the reactions and needs of the viewers, leading to a pitch for what essentially would be the same idea as long-running reality TV show Survivor 30 years later. Suppose you've got just a few people to live like old days and watch them to make a show. After, right out from, from everywhere, like savages, like wild men. So, what about Simon and Laura? Viewed today and knowing how the arc of television history bends, Simon and Laura feels truly prophetic, while also keeping a vestige of post-war innocence. Ian Carmichael's David, producer and creator of the show, is no Killian, but instead wants to find a wholesome, happy couple to put on the screen five days a week and promote a vision of ordinary, decent family life, while still injecting it with a little celebrity glamour. We show their ups and downs, their, well, the fun they get out of life, the minor tragedies that inevitably creep into their lives, uh, their hobbies, what they're talking about, thinking, reading, and so on, so on, and so on. A sort of Mrs. Dale's diary, in fact. Oh, no, no, nothing like that. We want an actual real-life couple. Settling on Kay Kendall and Peter Finch's eponymous couple, who are more than happy to suspend hostilities for a regular paycheck, unrelenting happiness proves a little stale after a while, prompting interference from the higher-ups of the BBC, who want a little more conflict to keep the audience engaged. Remember, BBC Broadcast Television had only been birthed around 20 years before, in 1936, only serving a comparatively tiny audience in London and the home counties, and including nearly seven years of complete shutdown due to the Second World War. It took until 1949 before a second transmitter outside London was opened, and it wasn't a truly national service until 1952, when around 28 million people were finally in range of transmission in time for the following year's coronation. The year of the film's release also coincided with the launch of the first commercial channel, ATV. Where the best-known satires of television in cinema had 30 or 40 years of history to draw upon, Simon and Laura was doing it while the medium was barely out of its infancy. Despite being an accomplished screenwriter, in fact the first woman to win an Academy Award for screenwriting, this was not one of Muriel Box's original screenplays. But Box does bring her experience of documentary and public information films to inject a strong vein of authenticity into the staging of the action. The film is full of hustle and bustle. The practice choreography between the machinery of broadcast and the people who work it complement perfectly the dialogue sprinkled with the opaque lexicon natural to every priesthood. Well, I am here because CT... CT. Oh, he's the controller of television. And where the play had just made reference to celebrities of the day, Box's postmodern interpretation cast actual contemporary television presenters and personalities, such as Nicholas Parsons and George Cansdale, John Ellison and Peter Hay and solicited some biting critiques on television itself from Gilbert Harding and Isabel Barnett, both household names from their appearances on What's My Line. My poor Simon, do you know what happens to you when you allow yourself to be regularly exhibited in that glass rectangle? No, not well, I'll really. tell you. I, I... You become public property. With this, Box carefully ensures the verisimilitude of her world, for instance referencing actual radio turned TV show Life with the Lions, which might have been a template for the Fosters, and using recognisable BBC properties like In Town Tonight. Talk about the Attenboroughs and the Olivias further blurs the lines between what is real and what just appears to be. It's striking how playfully cynical the film is about television, while still retaining the participation of the BBC and its assorted personalities. But if one televised a few pages of the London Telephone Directory regularly for five or six weeks, one would gain an average audience of over 10 million. We're a long way from TV as dystopian collaborationist here, of course, and it mostly falls into the category of the great British tradition of poking fun at oneself. But still, it doesn't pull many punches in showing the artificiality of the supposed reality, the complicity of the press in demanding sensationalism, and the fickleness of the viewing public. To be fair, it enjoys poking fun at the film industry too. Then I had an interview with a film producer. When? Immediately after lunch. It is now 5.30. Immediately after his lunch, not mine. Other aspects of the industry jump out to the modern viewer too. Thora Heard and Maurice Denham as the Foster's household staff, convinced into playing themselves on screen, are, seen from today, models of how to maintain your mental health when catapulted into reality TV stardom. Even so, they're not above the seductions of fame, with Heard's Jessie in particular pushing to develop her character a bit based on feedback from her fans. No, couldn't I have a bit of a crush on the master? Oh, 
Simon, uh, on Mr. Foster. Oh, a hopeless one, of course. You know, like Pagliacci. Timothy, the child actor brought in by the BBC to fill out their nuclear family, is also a surprisingly sympathetic portrayal. Despite Simon and Laura's undisguised loathing of him, he isn't the expected spoiled brat, and has a few sage observations about the adult actor's relationship to their younger counterparts, as well as some good advice about onset awareness. Well, take you. You haven't noticed that the camera's on Laura the whole time now. And then there's the centrepiece of the film. When misunderstandings and resentments reach boiling point, the Fosters' real-life quarrels spill out into the carefully constructed reality of the show. At first, it seems like disaster, but is in fact lapped up by the corporation management, the viewing public, and the press at large. Ultimately though, it is the television lens that saves the day, with the climax almost acting like a 1950s version of the Big Brother diary room, clearing up misunderstandings and bringing the romantic pairings back together. In this moment, television and cinema make peace with each other. A short-lived truce perhaps, but a satisfying one. Peter Finch, of course, would go on to star in a definitive classic film about the dangers of television, in the iconic role of Howard Beale, the news anchor whose on-air descent into madness is the core around which producers, corporate executives and media moguls vie for power in Sidney Lumet's 1976 film, Network. What a difference 20 years makes, as the cosy collegiality of the BBC is supplanted by the dog-eat-dog -dog world of American corporate boardrooms. The heritage of Simon and Laura is still there though, in a young, ambitious producer realising that new programming concepts based on real life are what's needed if you want that holy grail of television, a hit show. Got a bunch of hobgoblin radicals called the Ecumenical Liberation Army who go around taking home movies of themselves robbing banks. Uh, maybe they'll take movies of themselves kidnapping heiresses, um, hijacking 747s, bombing bridges, assassinating ambassadors. Well, we'd open each week's segment with that authentic footage, hire a couple of writers to write some story behind that footage, and we've got ourselves a series. It's clear that Simon and Laura was way ahead of the game, laying the groundwork that other films would follow, and satirising a genre of TV that wouldn't even find its heyday for another 50 years. It's a rare satire too that feels acerbic and fresh, with sharp observations about its subject, while demonstrating a deep affection for it. Most of all though is the foresight, that could already see in the 1950s the danger inherent in a medium like television that is both populist and which demands a constant daily renewal of output. So be very, very careful what you sign up for. Okay, cut. <laughs>